DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined once again by Father Donald Haggerty, who is a priest of the Archdiocese of New York serving at St. Patrick's Cathedral. He has taught moral theology in Maryland, New York, and Ethiopia, and has conducted numerous retreats for St. Mother Teresa's Missionaries of Charity. He's the author of Contemplative Provocations, Contemplative Hunger, and Conversion. With Father Donald Haggerty, we go inside the pages of Contemplative Enigmas, Insights and Aid on the Path to Deeper Prayer, published by Ignatius Press. Father Haggerty, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Chris, for having me. I appreciate this. Contemplative Enigmas is so wonderful. The previous works you've brought to us are have always been outstanding, but this one in particular seems to really guide us in this spiritual journey. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate your, your comments. Thank you. What brought about the desire to want to offer this work? Well, I felt there was, uh, I could expand the discussion after the contemplative provocations, the contemplative hunger, and I continued to have notes that I wanted to refine and, you know, place into similar kind of concise statements. And and also I felt uh, I'm, I'm meeting more and more people that are serious about prayer, lay people. I'm at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, and, you know, despite the impression of New York City being so frenetic, which it is, and so active and worldly and driven, you know, there are a lot of people very serious about prayer. And I think that's true throughout the country, the West, you know, and so this book is a kind of extension on uh, the previous two books that were serious about prayer and spirituality and and with very particular kind of um, uh, exposure in a way of some of the difficulties that take place as we live a long life of prayer and and some of the mystery of contemplative prayer. So I felt there was enough material that I had in notes to really work at that, and and this is the result. What I love about it so much is that it really guides us through the journey, and yet it doesn't necessarily give us an outline, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Instead, it allows you in the reflections, the communion, as it were, that you had that flowed from your prayer and that you're sharing with us. And instead, it meets us wherever we're at. And there's like these ping moments, if I can call it that, where it's like, oh, yeah, okay. And somehow it, it continues to encourage you onward. There are few works that do that as well as what you've done here. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh... And I think, you know, I think that's an insightful comment because I'm not trying to write a book, you know, how to pray. Uh, it's not a book about methods, but really um, trying to reach down and expose some of the experience that happens in prayer. And it's not simply my experience. Um, I've had many, you know, dozens of retreats, actually over 120 retreats with the Missionaries of Charity, Mother Teresa's congregation. And also with Carmelites, to a lesser degree, some Port Clare convents, the CFR friars, I've got to know their sisters also. So some of these people are serious people of prayer. And, you know, this is this work of a convergence of awareness. My own reading, having read St. John of the Cross so long now. So, um... The effort or the what's here in the in this book is a I think it's a these are stimuli for um realizing there's much more greater depth than than we sometimes realize in in our encounter with God in prayer. You really hit it there. From the very beginning you steep us in an in incredible wisdom. You take just a like three reflections, and then a deeper fourth entrance into a teaching from a particular saint or very holy person. And then you allow us to to kind of enter into a reflection 
And yet the reflection doesn't tell us so much what we have to do, but it's more of an invitation. I mean, I'm not trying to sound esoteric, but I mean, it's gentle as that, but that seems like such a God way of doing it, doesn't it? Well, thank you, Chris. That's, uh, that sounds uh, accurate. And, and, and you know, the effort is, uh, again, to expose and uh, the, the, the quotations, too, from the saints, they're more abundant this time than in those other books. Uh, and that's something, you know, people have their different hobbies. I could say that one of my hobbies, if that's the word for it, has been when I've seen good, good statements, and quotations, I've always copied them down in notebook. And those have proved very valuable, and it's the kind of thing that I think is valuable for people in prayer, like this book, perhaps, to take a paragraph or a quotation of a saint and ponder a bit, and then that becomes a little bit of a bridge, even while we're in prayer, that we've begun to walk across, you know, the bridge toward us our Lord, and maybe give him a chance to walk toward us on that bridge. And, you know, that's the value of a book like this, um, to have a stimuli in front of us and to realize this, you know, I'm reaching out towards something uh, for greater encounter with God. And that's my, my sense of it. Well, that encounter is really unique for each person, isn't it? Uh, absolutely, and also as we go on in life, you know, it differs even in our own life. But uh, you know, much of the the true, authentic, contemplative experience in life is to realize, you know, the hiddenness of God may become more intense. His concealment, you know, the true reality of God's utter holiness becomes more vivid, perhaps, to us as we uh, continue in life. And, and this is the effect of prayer. And the St. John of the Cross is very strong on that. I think the Carmelites will tell you very you know, strongly if you sit with them in a, in a, in a parlor in a Carmelite convent, you know, how real the intensity of God's presence is while he remains very concealed and, 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 the, and the difficulty of bearing with that hiddenness and concealment. In, in a long life of prayer. You know, I think when you wrote your first book, or at least when it first came out in Contemplative Provocations, that you were a missionary, essentially. Or can I say that? I mean, you were at least serving in Africa, if I recall correctly. That was, that's correct. When it, was, uh, when it was published in 2013, I was, uh, I was in a four-year period in Ethiopia, I was teaching in the seminary there, but also I went there primarily because I had gone for a number of retreats dating back to 1993 in Ethiopia with Missionaries of Charity, and I'd been six or seven times there. So I had an opportunity to request to Cardinal Connor, uh, Cardinal Dolan uh, to be transferred from the seminary in New York to Ethiopia. So. But some of that writing dated back, you know, taking notes, pondering, keeping some. So some of that I had worked on for some time, and then that book was eventually published in 2013 when I was in the middle of that Ethiopian time. It's telling because there are some who may feel that that we would need a experience like that, traveling sometimes out of our own comfort zone and, and going to a foreign land and maybe serving in a mission, doing a pilgrimage. Or maybe it's the entrance into religious life where you're in a contemplative community. You're open in a greater way to that experience of God that it can be difficult in our present situation for most of us who are engaged in a very active experience of the world. And then from that place in Ethiopia, you've been plucked right into the busiest city, probably in one of the busiest areas at least in this country, if not in, in the world. Yeah, I think it's, it's very true to, to try to have, if we, if we can, I mean, it depends on a person's uh, state of life and family life, marriage, children, the age of children, but to try to, um, to try to do some different things, you know, sometimes that are more radical 
and you know, it could be it could be working as a volunteer Mother Teresa Sisters or some other um, you know, place in a city. Uh or taking one of those mission trips to a third world country which parishes do at times. Uh but something that kinda of takes you out of the the realm of the ordinary that we're very familiar with and comfortable with. Uh and certainly, you know, like making radical kind of moves to have, to open up to more prayer in one's life. I mean, a lot of places now, a lot of churches do have Eucharistic adoration. Um, some of them have 24-hour adoration in places. And, you know, to take those kind of steps to open up more fully to God, maybe as children get older, you know, I think many times people in the middle of life sense this invitation from God to take a greater step toward him. And but some kind of radical move does help. I mean my move to Ethiopia definitely helped a lot in my life because also it was a a lonely time, frankly, you know, somewhat to leave New York where I knew a lot of people and then to go to the middle of nowhere, you know, in some ways. Um, I had I, people I met there, but that, that was a good experience for receiving more the, uh, you know, the, the greatness of God's presence and you know, how much he really takes our life seriously. The thing that I found so compelling about this particular work, Father Haggerty, for me personally, maybe I, I wonder if it speaks to the hearts of others in this way too, it was our struggle with silence, the uh, the suffering of silence, as it were, that we have to be willing to walk into that fire to be able to really be receptive to that presence of God. But the silence, that is so foreign in our culture today. Well, I agree, and that's a, uh, that's a key point of any you know, serious spiritual life. And uh, unless we, you know, turn the phones off somewhat, not just the silence of uh, sound around us, but the the uh, the insistence on distraction. You know, if the phone is ringing constantly, people are checking text messages. Uh, you know, that kind of perpetual distraction in life is 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 a an obstacle to a life with God and. If you, if sometimes it's good to think, you know, well, how do they live in monasteries or these cloisters, and and they really do live apart from that. You know, they don't carry cell phones around, I don't think, and <laughs> and uh, some need for silence there. There is that great work, of course, of Cardinal Sarah from a couple of years ago, the Power of Silence, mm-hmm. and you know, such a an invitation to, and and that's written for all of us who live in the world, to to at least block out some times in a day. I may, I may have said this before, even when we talked previously, but the, you know, the value even of small moments of silence, if we can quiet down for three minutes, five minutes, really enter into silence, those pauses in a day can have a, a great stimulus for prayer. Well, do you think part of the problem, well, I should say I know that you think this is part of the problem because I've just dove into this book so strongly, but we expect to have a feeling, you know, even the feeling that I this is going to bring me great peace. Sometimes in our prayer, we're not necessarily going to feel something that is always peaceful. Is that a fair way of saying that, Father? Yeah, that's definitely true. And I think God, he values our perseverance through the seasons of prayer. And, you know, we're used to in the United States, you know, going through four very different seasons in most parts of the country. And there are different seasons, even from week to week, day to day, in a way, in prayer. And sometimes the seasons are long. So there could be a long duration duration of feeling quite empty and you know dry, no real feeling in prayer. 
um, and yet to live with deeper certitude of faith in that time. You know, that's why it is it is valuable to to pray in front of the presence of our Lord in the Eucharist. If we can pray in a church before a tabernacle or a monstrance, that does have value because His presence is so real and. But the St. John of the Cross, you know, is really strong on and says thing. The real reality of this is the certitude of our faith intensifies even when we feel very empty, there's dryness, perhaps the mind is not cooperative in prayer and there are distractions. But this deep certitude that we are in the presence of his gaze on our, on our soul, our life, and and that's a tender gaze, even if it's not felt. One of the powerful chapters, well, everyone is, every chapter is powerful. I think if people just took a couple pages a day and just pondered of what you've offered, again, and you're very humble in saying that this is something that has been fed to you by the teachings of others and their experiences, but also fed from that in communion with the Holy Spirit. But the chapter on the holy mystery of transcendence, that particular area, that mystery of transcendence, I think that's what we quest for. You hear it so often, don't you, Father, when you hear people saying, I'm I'm spiritual but not religious. They're speaking out of this, something's pulling on them, and they just can't put their finger on it, can they? That's very true. And the, you know, the reality of God is, you know, he's, he's utterly personal and three persons and one God and, and Jesus, you know, is there in front of us in the Gospels so vividly often. And yet this is God and, you know, the this holy mystery of transcendence that we can never, you know, we can only reach out in, in some manner toward that infinite reality of God and and he remains continually mystery in front of us. This is why, you know, this reality of his concealment is this concealment and utter mystery. And the and John of the Cross is so good on this too. He you know in this passage, for instance, he'll say, "Seek him ever as one hidden, for you exalt God immensely. Approach very near to him when you consider him higher and deeper than anything you can reach." And never desire satisfaction what you understand, but what you do not understand about him. Seeking him in faith. And he goes on, however surely it may seem you find and experience and understand God, you must, because he is inaccessible and concealed, a transcendent, always regard him as hidden and serve him who is hidden in a secret way. You know, the beauty of words like that, I mean, I've read that, <laughs> I'm not exaggerating, probably more than at least a hundred times in my life, you know, probably mm-hmm. many more. And those kind of passages, you know, you never get to the end of the truth of them. They're, and that's what I, I, I wanted to do in this kind of book, too, that these are passages that, and the quotations, which are maybe worth the price of the book, mm-hmm. they are... Uh, they lead us on and on to, you know, something of a greater mystery and greater truth in God. We'll return to Inside the Pages in just a moment. Did you know that you can obtain a free app which contains all your favorite Discerning Hearts programs? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Archbishop George Lucas, Father Mauritius Fildi, and so many more, including episodes from Inside the Pages, can be obtained on the Discerning Hearts free app. This also includes all the novenas and devotionals and prayers, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, the Chaplet of St. Michael, and the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady, all available on the Discerning Hearts free app. Visit the iTunes and Google Play app stores to obtain your free Discerning Hearts app today. A Prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, 
my understanding, and my entire will, all that I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to Inside the Pages. We're talking with Father Donald Haggerty about his book, Contemplative Enigmas, Insights and Aid on the Path to Deeper Prayer. And the counsel that you give us when you are in these periods of questing and you're seeking and to find ourselves in front of the Blessed Sacrament, to dive into the sacramental mystery, as it were, in the very real way, that's an acknowledgement of God's presence. You see it. I, I can't help but think, not far from where you're at, I mean, Dorothy Day, in those early years, watching women go to Mass early in the morning, and she follows them, and there's something that's just pulling her there. There's a desire. There's something that it, it, that's a bit of the pull of transcendence, isn't it? Yeah, that's a good way to, um, you know, a good image for it because we all have to. There's a flame within each of us, you know, and there's a great fire in God, and and it, there's an interesting, you know, reality. If you put a small flame near a greater fire, that flame leans in that direction, bends toward it, mm. and we have to, you know, kind of sense that within us, that this flame within us, we don't want to to frustrate it, you know, leave it just, you know, simmering, you know, in, in a kind of, uh, uh, you know, without, without more, and, and put it near that greater fire, it's going to be pulled toward that. So, you know, getting inside a church, being aware, just putting ourselves in silence, you know, in, a, in the church, that in itself begins to affect lives, I think. And you know, m many people, I, it's it's unfortunate, you know, I see it as a priest. I think many people only come to a church, and you know, many Catholics, thank God, they do come on Sundays, but they only come when there's a, a great crowd, you know, in, in a Sunday Mass, and they don't realize the beautiful attraction of being in, in the quiet of a church. Not too many people there. You know, maybe the Mass is over or before Mass. Just to be in the quiet of a church, it's an incredible experience. And, and you know, to, to find that in one's life, right away, that's a game changer right there, I think. You know, Father, I think you did a beautiful job of entering into the mystery of what has been called the dark night, that place where God does not at first seem present to us. It's though the light switch has been tripped off. Yes, I mean, there is a, it, it sounds like such a forbidding image, but, um, you know, this notion of, of, of the dark night, you know, that has, you know, different layers of, of uh, possibility and depth to it. But it's a, uh, you know, it's an image that is just saying in some way, you know, to get out into the deeper water, as our Lord said in the Gospel, you know, to Peter, put your boat out to the deep, into the deep. And, 
you know, the darkness that we undergo is, is really more the question of getting closer to God allows his greater infinitude to affect our soul more. And, you know, John of the Cross, again, is very strong on this understanding that as faith intensifies, it produces a certain darkness in the, in the mind that God is, is is understood to be that much more incomprehensible. That we, we and St. Thomas Aquinas will have spoken of that also, that, that God is known as one who is more unknown, that we love him in a greater way in realizing we know him, but as one who is unknown in a certain way. So, you know, that experience is a, is a real thing. Some Mother Teresa's uh, accounts that came out after her death of her darkness of soul is is like an, is a good example of that. I mean, she had extreme ex- experiences of that as a saint, but she was very, as we could, would say, it's extremely close to our Lord, loved the Eucharist, you know, saw it literally and heard Jesus in the poor, and yet experience this suffering of, of a certain darkness within. But I think that's, you know, it's, all, it's good to hear that because many people undergo, you know, some trials of darkness in their life, the difficulty of some shadows around them, and, and to realize that this is more purification and God's chance to reach out to the soul. Uh, and it's not, a, it's not a sign of illness spiritually, or that we've gone off in a detour at all, that it's part of the life of faith deepening and intensifying over a lifetime, mm. and it affects the life of prayer. Uh, Father, could you speak to something I think that is so rampant? It probably always has been. Uh, maybe it's just, it, it seems more heightened because of, of our interconnectedness through social media, through television, through our engagement with others, that there's this this collective sense of fear that expresses itself not only in its statement of fear, but it becomes anger, it becomes division, it becomes all these other things that can even enter in not only in the surface of our engagement with the world, but it can also get into the center of that prayer of ours that we're trying so desperately in some cases to connect with. You know, I think, uh, you know, it's part of that incomprehension of God that we have to, we have to trust that God's hand is, is in, in all things that he permits and he's, he is present in everything. And there is a need to, with a certain, you could say, mental or even emotional austerity, to to be careful not to not to get frustrated that we um, are letting go, you know, again and again in our lives and placing things in the hands of God, you know, accepting divine providence even when it's not understood. You know, I always like this expression of Jesus when, when he was going to wash the feet of the apostles and we know Peter objected to that as described in chapter 13 of John and and then Jesus said to him, you do not know now what I am doing. Later you will understand. And, you know, this is part of the reality of life for all of us that we don't understand everything right away and we could have, you know, some some anger, some frustration, and even, you know, temptation of resentment, you know, God, what are you doing? You know, why are you abandoning? You know, why are you leaving us alone like this? And in fact, it's not true. You know, he is working through all of this to invite us to deeper faith, perhaps greater offering, and that he has his plan being worked out through all things. You know, it's so interesting, Father. You've had an experience, as we talked about earlier, about your, yourself going to Ethiopia. And, but you've also, in your retreat life, you obviously you have a steeping in the Carmelite tradition, 
which is, again, noted for its contemplation, and even for those who have been called to that life to a type of movement into the cloister. But then you also had the missionaries of charity, who are these incredible servants to the world, who also are very anchored in their prayer. It, it really is two very different movements of that response to action. How has that been for you? I mean, it, 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 there is such a marked difference, isn't there? Uh, there's a great difference in the, uh, you know, in the structure of the life in one sense. You know, one, you know, the missionary charity life is a, is a very demanding, you know, life in their poverty and then they're giving up themselves to the, you know, the really serious poor throughout the world, especially in these third world countries. But, you know, here in the even the West, you know, where they live in slums, and and a Carmelite who is queen living in the quiet of a cloister, you know, that monastic life. But I think, you know, it, it's it's interesting to see the common denominator in those lives that they they in both cases there is this challenge. You know, it depends on the person to to offer their life completely to God, to belong entirely to God. I remember hearing this uh, this story that one time a priest said to Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa, you have such a beautiful life, such a great vocation, giving your life to the poor as you do. And Mother Teresa said, no, that's, that's not my vocation. My vocation is to belong entirely to Jesus Christ. Mm. And... To me, that's you know the kind of the common denominator, whether the person's in the cloister or the missionary of charity, and you know, and the missionary of charity is really being asked by God in her vocation as well. Mother Teresa asked for it to, to really just try to live a contemplative kind of life, a contemplative life of mercy, mm-hmm. really making the effort to literally to see Jesus mysteriously, you know, present in a hidden way, concealed in his presence in the course of the poor. And so there's more similarities than um, in this than, you know, sometimes on the uh, the surface level. And I, I have seen some sisters who are very seriously, you know, prayerful people not all because it's a hard life and humanity is humanity. But when they are when they're great, they are very great, you know, as great as any any Carmelite I would say in the in the cloister in regards to their prayer life. So it's uh it's a good thing to realize that for us too or who live in the world, that we can be very prayerful despite, you know, what can be a certain busyness in life to some degree. And we have to try to pursue that. Because God will want to encourage it in us as we as we go on in years. Mm. I, I think one of the things, one of the greatest lessons God is trying to teach us is is we need to pray. And sometimes people discover it maybe when they're older, in their sixties, when they retire, and then then it opens up that there are thresholds that open, even for religious or priests. Like when I spoke in that book on conversion, of second conversion. That's largely a question of the life of prayer suddenly really awakening in a life. And this happens with missionaries of charity. It happens in in the cloisters also. See, now this is why I love, love, love your work, but I love this book so much because I think what you've just described is the calling that we all have. Of course, it's the universal call to holiness, but how we can live that out, you know, whether you're a mom with kids, whether you're a businessman, businesswoman out there, you're teaching in the schools, in the hospital, wherever you are, that looking for the hiddenness to listen to him, and maybe it is in the voice of that person before you, is not unlike the same kind of call that those missionaries of charity have. I mean, we all, can we say that we all in some way have that kind of missionary response to the world? I mean, I think, I think it's a great comment, Chris, because and that's why I think the, the recognition of Mother Teresa's order, for instance, were these cloisters that 
we have to realize that we can learn so much from that life. You know, Mother Teresa taught her early sisters, she taught them all the decades, you know, pray ejaculations often. Mm-hmm. You know, when, you're, when your mind is, uh, when you're doing the work, you know, taking care of a patient or doing cleaning, do, doing all these things, pray ejaculations. Well, that's not just for a cloister. There are many people traveling who could repeat an ejaculation over and over or a rosary. Um, you know, when we're traveling, you know, many people listen to, you know, now the earphone thing is like constant. You're seeing people, we can actually pray or you can put some, some nice, something spiritual in that, in the headphones. Mm-hmm. You know, something that brings the presence of, of God often. And, you know, we have a lot to learn from that missionary of Char- Mother Teresa. You know, she really took literally that our Lord is there and the poor and that, that poverty can have many disguises. You know, the old person who may be quite well off, which you might see in New York, and yet they're, they're as lonely as anybody on the street, you know, in, um, in Calcutta. And so the poverty of many different disguises where our Lord is inviting, you know, a, you know, reaching out from ourselves, you know, in charity toward another and really touch mysteriously all those presents. What you invite us to as well is not to necessarily hide from the world, try to distance ourselves but away from the world by diving into the ordinary means of grace, separating ourselves by going into the church, but instead anchoring ourselves. It's like mooring ourselves to the ordinary means of grace, to the the beauty of the, the not just the church's liturgy, but the experience of God's creation, anchor us so that we can then be out in the world, to be out in the places where he needs us to be. Is that a fair statement, Father? Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a very good statement. And, you know, I think the older uh, language that separated you know, the contemplative life was considered to be the cloister, the monastery, and the active life was out in the world. But I, you know, what I've tried to do also with these books is is, uh, is say, and I think it's a legitimate thing to say that there's the possibility of living serious interior life with God, of course, outside a cloister or monastery. And of course, all the saints, had serious depth of interior life. And that's what it means to try to cultivate something more contemplative in our prayer, in our awareness of God. And the effect of a deeper interior life, even involuntarily, is going to to make us leap much more out toward other people and toward need. You know, our eyes open up more. You know, instead of that kind of pull inward on ourselves, the deeper interior life with God does the opposite. It leads us out more. Our eyes are more sensitive, you know, to the you know, the suffering of other people, the, the awareness of, of the need of others. And you know, if we live in, there's a great advantage, I think, like a missionary of charity, to have the poor in their life opens them to more action in charity. And that's true for all of us, that we, if we live, if you have family, if you have children, if you work, you know, and you have contact with people, that, that reaching out beyond ourself is a, uh, you know, is, a, is a, an essential aspect of, of a serious life with God. And also, as we're out in that world, I, I think some of the benchmarks, you, you mention it frequently in the book, you talk about the virtues. Living a life as I think, what was it, Father Benedict Rochelle called it, the virtue-driven life. Mm-hmm. That's a good benchmark for us, isn't it? I mean, you tell us not to look at ourselves so much, but allow God to shine the light into us, what he sees in us. But we have to watch the fruit of our actions. And if it's not virtue flowing out of us, then we're in trouble, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, that's really true. I think and, and a, lot of, a lot of prayer depends on you know, leaving ourselves alone, that we don't want to be gazing on ourselves. You know, more serious prayer makes us 
us forget ourselves. And I think that's a that's a great reality of any holiness, which I've seen in missionaries of charity. When they're really holy, they're very self-forgetful, and they're, they're not paying attention to themselves at all. You know, their focus is on the other, and that's I think that's an aspect of prayer in their lives that. You know, they're not really focused on themselves. They're focused on the crucifix, our Lord on the cross, you know, on on the real reality of Jesus and the monstrance. And and that kind of outward turn, leaving the self behind, you know, allows the gospel really to become alive. That, you know, we are meant to lose ourselves in love for another. And that's what happens in marriage when a, a husband and wife are really, you know, serious spiritual people, you know, the other becomes more important. And and mysteriously, you know, without looking at it then, the person is more filled with God. And I think that's a... It, these things, you know, sometimes we would think, well, it's only for the religious or contemplative life. It's only... I think when we have... Ex, when we read these things, my experience in my life has been it's always lifted me up to have experience with the missionaries of charity or the Carmelites in, in a lesser way or to read St. John of the Cross, this lifts and makes you leap much more to a, a you know, higher standard. And then we're trying to walk in that direction then constantly in life. Mm. Oh, Father Haggerty, I wish we had more time. Uh, the, you know, there are many works out there in the spiritual life that are very noble, very how-tos and what-to-do type of works out there. And they're very important in some ways, but there's also something that is so beautiful when you can open up a beautiful book that communicates, not just teaches, but offers communion, where you just want to sit in the presence of the work. You just, you open it up and you, you take it in and you just, oh, you know, a a profound peace comes about. I think it's so valued. And that's what your books do, Father Haggerty, and particularly the contemplative enigmas. It's just so lovely. It's so important today. Thank you so much, Chris. I have to uh, say, uh, I have to be humble after this, after your such nice words. But thank you so much for for your words. And and thank you so much for having me on your program. Well, we thank you, Father. Can we have your blessing before we close? Sure. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you, upon your listeners, and bring always the presence and protection of our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph upon all of your lives. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Haggerty. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate this very much. With Father Donald Haggerty, we've gone inside the pages of Contemplative Enigmas, Insights and Aid on the Path to Deeper Prayer. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to Ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit DiscerningHearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors.